presence is powerful. This week, this week alone, we had an opportunity to love on someone in our community. Uh, many of you who are on Facebook and on the Connect family page, you know that uh, Stacy and Cindy, they were on vacation, they were in Alaska, and they were enjoying their cruise in Alaska, and, and as soon as Cindy got on the boat, she started losing vision in one of her eyes. And we, we quickly realized that she had a retinal detachment. And so we put that on Facebook, and then you guys, you just started praying. Prayers going up, and I saw it. I'm praying. We're praying right now. Praying, praying, praying. And I loved it because we got a lot of love, and y'all showed a lot of love from a distance through technology. And man, were we thankful. I'll tell you this, uh, those prayers were seen, and they were heard, and they were felt. Amen? Uh, Cindy uh, had surgery in Lubbock. Uh, on Friday, and she's doing great right now. She had a follow-up appointment yesterday. Uh, she's actually being able to see this close in the eye now, so they think that she's going to get her vision back. And so praise God for that. Amen? Amen. Oh, yeah, praise God for that. You know, uh, but they were your prayers, they were seen, they were heard, they, they were, heard, they were felt. Uh, it's hard to be present, though, when you're over 3,000 miles apart, right? When you're over 58 hours away from each other, it's hard to be present. I, I do want to share this. It's not discounting everybody else's prayers, but I, I want to share something important. Jeremy decided, man, this is going on with Cindy. I'm going to call Stacy. I don't care where he is in the world. And so he called him. And you know what's cool about that? Is that Stacy was trying to get a hold of, of myself and my wife. He couldn't get a hold of us because he couldn't call out. And so when Jeremy called in, he said, hey, I've got a message that I need to relate to Trent and Christy. Thank God you reached me. And so by unction of the Holy Spirit, he was able to be present on the phone, not just pray for them, but he was able to pray with them. And I'm telling you guys, presence is powerful. Amen? Amen. Reminds me of last week's scripture, when a brother or a sister in Christ is in need, be eager and ready to help. And one of the ways that we know when a brother or sister in, in Christ is in need is when we're in community with one another. When, when you're together, when you're in friendship, you know that they're in need. And Chris, man... Chris, we had lunch this week, and he was ready to be the wheelman. Uh, he was ready to drive them from Anchorage to Lubbock, if need be. That's presence, amen? That's practicing presence. And that's something we all need to be engaged in. Uh, looking for opportunities every day, every week, to be present. And so that was last week's focus. Uh, this week, I'd like to direct our focus uh, in a different way uh, than just being present. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. Be present, yes, but be engaged. Amen? Uh, we're going to have to preach this. Y'all are silent on that. So, you know, like, I don't know where you're going, Trent, so I'm not going to aim in you yet. But be engaged. Don't just be physically present, but be intentionally engaged. Uh, can I get a witness? There's lots of us in here this morning that need good Christian relationships in our life. Man, we shared the, t the statistics last week. We might have friends in the world, but how many know we need good, godly friendships? Amen. We need friendships that, that are different than friendships in the world. So we need to practice presence, yes, but we need to be engaged. Be engaged in the Lord. Be engaged in each other. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 4, verse 8. He said, most important of all, continue to show deep, Love for each other, for love co covers a multitude of sins. I want you to notice that he didn't say, continue your shallow Sunday morning love for each other. <laughs> no, he said, continue in your deep, engaging, sincere love for one another. So it, it's, that's where the person that's in the room is the most important person to you. Uh, I, I know most of you have seen this, but maybe, maybe some of you are this. And so this is for you this morning. But you, you go into a restaurant and you, you notice a, a family of four, maybe it's some older kids, and what do you see? You see this, right? And the older ones, they're doing this. And the young ones are doing this. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Hey, hey I got an amen over here. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about. Because, because, listen, this is what we've become when we're together. I'm wondering, are they texting each other? Right? Uh, my nephews, we went on vacation to the mountains of, of New Mexico. I mean, that was God's country. It's mountains. It's New Mexico. And, man, we're loving on the Lord in the mountains. 
uh, catching fish for Jesus. And uh, my nephews, they were able to come with us this time. And we were so excited. And, and, and we told them, we're not going to really be roughing it. We're not going to be camping, camping. We're going to be, as Brenda called it, glamping. We're going to be in a cabin this, this time. And the boys were like, oh, God, thank, thank God. And I was like, why? Like, we need our cell phone reception. I was like, why do you need your cell phone reception? And they said, because we got to keep our streaks alive, Uncle Trent. I guess you know what a streak is. <laughs> we got to keep our streaks alive, Uncle Trent. They had to stay connected with their friends, they told me. Listen, I guess being connected with friends, uh, has, that definition has skewed over time, has it not? And so they, they had to be connected to friends. You know what they were doing with their phones while we're... Hey, Christy's laughing. She's over where I'm going. You know what they were doing with their phones? They, they were uh, on this app called Snapchat, right? And they loved this app, and, and they had to keep their streaks alive. And what streaks were uh, on Snapchat, because I didn't know, was their uninterrupted uh, days of contact with friends. Basically, you miss a day, your streak is broke, right? You've got you to at least have a, a day on Snapchat with your friends so you can keep your streaks alive. Some of you look like you have heard. How many of you are hearing this for the first time? Hallelujah, I'm not alone. Thank you, Jesus. So they had to keep their streaks alive. It's kind of like uh, days on the job without incident, right? And so that's what they were doing. They had to keep their streaks alive. And I didn't know what streaking was. I mean, streaking when I was a kid had a different meaning than we were praying for our nephews. But, but listen, they would take their phone when we're in the mountains and all this beauty and, and the, the splendor of God, and they would take pictures of themselves. And I'm not talking like, like awesome selfies like duck face or, or blue steel or whatever you want to call it. They weren't doing that. They were just, they'd take their phone, take a picture of themselves, send it to a friend. Take their phone, take a picture of us eating pasta, send it to a friend. Take a picture. I saw them as we're driving down the road, take a picture of the side mirror. I said, why are you taking a picture of the side mirror? I'm just keep my streaks alive, showing my friends. They are present in bodily form. They were in the room, but can I get a witness? They were alone together. Church, we need to be engaged. Could you imagine how rude it would be if you and I are in deep, awesome conversation and you're just pouring your heart out to me and I'm listening and I'm engaging with you in a way and as you're pouring your heart out to me, I decided to reach down to my backpack and I pull out my book. You know the book I've been reading? And I go to my, my favorite page, and you keep talking, I start reading it. Uh-huh. And I keep reading this book for a couple pages. Then I, I put my marker down, and I put it back down, and I go, oh, go on, go on. You'd be thinking, what? And so you're getting back into it, you start talking again, and, and, and I'm engaged, and we're engaged, and we start having conversation. And then I'm like, think for a second as we're talking, and I pull out my to-do list, and I go, hmm, got to get butter, got to mow the lawn, Got to fly to Alaska. <laughs> and, and then I put my list away and go, oh, go on, go on, I'm listening, go ahead, go ahead. And then you're okay, I'm, I'm, you start pouring your heart in, you pour your heart in again. And I go, yeah, and I walk away. And I talk to somebody else over here and say, hey, how are you doing? I'm glad to see you today. I'm, yeah, I missed you last Sunday, glad you're here. Yeah, I was talking to this guy, I'll get back with you in a minute. Yeah, bye. And I come back. So you were saying... Y'all look at me like I'm a freak. What are you doing? But in reality, isn't that what we do? Isn't that what we're doing? We're, we're sitting with someone that's really important to us. We're sitting with someone face to face, somebody that really matters. And the whole time we're doing this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Y'all feel me? Okay. Church, we need to be engaged. Amen? Amen. Listen. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Let's not just say we're brothers and sisters on Sunday morning. Let's show the truth by our actions. Let's really have a deep, Love for one another. I'm going to keep this up there because I want us to think about who's writing this. This is John. He's the self-proclaimed favorite of Jesus. 
He wrote, it in, he wrote it in John himself. He wrote, the one loved by Jesus. Y'all don't find that funny. I thought that was hilarious. It's like when Moses wrote in, in, in the books that he wrote, Moses was the meekest man on the planet. Y'all don't find that funny? It's like if I were to write a book about myself and say, Trent is the most humble man I know. Okay. You got to work on your humor, guys. Well, John, he's the one who wrote this. And you got to think about who he was. Scriptures say that he, he loved Jesus and he was the one that was loved by Jesus. He was a friend of Jesus. He knew what, what godly friendships meant. He was a friend with Jesus, with God in the flesh. And, and, and some might say, well, well John, that's, that's presumptuous to think you're a friend of God. That sure is arrogant, John. You know, I'm on the other end of that spectrum of thought. I'm sitting here thinking, church, how cool would it be to know that you're so loved by God that you think you're his favorite? Right? Just to wake up in the morning and go, it's me, the one loved by Jesus. Amen. Right? Well, that's what God wants from you. That's what God wants to give you, church. I, I don't know about you, but I want to be the one loved by God. How about you? Amen. And so... So here, I tell you what, John, even though he called himself the one loved by Jesus, he was the only one of the twelve present at the foot of the cross. The only one present at the foot of the cross. And he was engaged. He engaged with Jesus. He wasn't just present in bodily form, but he engaged. In the Last Supper, he was the one that reclined on Jesus, the Scriptures say. Here at the cross, he was engaged with the Lord. So much so that Jesus... From the cross, looked down upon his mother and saw John standing next to her. And he looked at his mother and said, dear woman. And he looked at John and he said, this is your son. And he looked at, he looked at Mary and he said, she is your mother. Wow, church. Wow, he wasn't just present, but he was engaged. And think about who's writing this. Show the truth by our actions. Don't just say you love, but, but love each other and show the truth by your actions. From the cross and from that point on, John took Mary in his own home as his own mother. Why? Because of his friendship with Jesus. Because he had a different kind of friendship with Jesus than just a worldly friendship. You know what? In this scripture, it was the greatest weapon that the first century church had. If you think about the first century church, they were so persecuted, so reviled by the world. Even the religious hated them. Right? Man, you start doing a lot of good for God and the religious community will hate you too. But they were so persecuted that, you know what they did? They turned inward. And they looked for each other. They didn't look to cannibalize each other. They looked towards each other and they loved each other with such a great love and in such unity in the body of Christ that they just, they were there for one another. They showed their love by their actions. You know, when one had need, you know what they did? The rest of them sold what they had so they could, they could help with the one in need. So much so that the scriptures say that there was not one needy among them. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. Now, I'm not telling you you got to go sell everything you got, right? It, to really love the Lord, you got to sell all your possessions. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you got to be engaged. Be truly engaged and show your love by your actions. By your actions. When I think of engaging, and I think of the word to engage, I think of mechanisms, gears, cogs, things that go together, right? I, I think of like uh, the key starts the starter. The, the, so that means the key engages with the starter, and the starter engages with the engine, and the engine engages with the axle, and the axle the wheels. You get the point? <laughs> I might have missed a few links. I'm not a car guy. But you, you get the point, okay? When, when the whole of the machine and all its parts are engaging the way they're supposed to in harmony with one another then the mechanism, the machine, does exactly what it was created to do. It does 
what it was made for, church. When we, the body of Christ, are knit together in harmony and we are engaging with one another as the whole, then we are doing exactly what God created us to do. And we are being who God created us to be. Amen? Uh, uh, <laughs> it fulfills the purpose of its maker. Jesus told Peter, Peter, upon this rock, he was saying, upon this revelation, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Y'all remember that? Okay. <laughs> that means Jesus is the one who's building this, not us. That means the church is his thing. We just get to be a part of it. Do you hear me? But here's what's cool. Jesus is the one who's building it and putting it together. And we see that the spirit, he's the one who gives gifts to men as he desires. And he's the one who's putting pieces together because he knows how this machine's supposed to work. And here's the cool part. Jesus didn't just stop at that saying when he said, Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He went on to go in verse 19. He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He didn't just stop at his work being completed and no one else has a part in it. Church, he gave us the opportunity to have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He gave us the opportunity to engage. Engage with one another. I remember the first time I took Breland on a, uh, on a roller coaster ride. It, it wasn't Six Flags. It wasn't Fiesta, Texas. It was here in good old Lubbock, Texas. We went to Joyland. And, and the first uh, uh, roller coaster ride she rode was the mousetrap. Anybody rode the mousetrap? Oh, oh wow. It, ooh, painful. <laughs> well, yeah, we were going up the mountain. You know, they are discontinuing that ride, or they already have. Did y'all read about that? It was past its safety date, I guess. <laughs> it was by the time we wrote it. But we're, we're going up the ramp. And you know what I'm talking about, the, the first ramp. And Breen looks at me, Dad, I don't know if I can do this. And I looked at her and said, Babe, you're kind of committed. <laughs> and you know, she did great. She loved every minute of it. You know what? I don't think she would have done as well had she been alone. But she did great. But she was kind of committed. She's kind of committed. I want to take us to a different place right now. Uh, Pastor, how on earth could you take your daughter on the mousetrap? Well, like Abraham to Isaac, God spareth her soul. Amen? Let, let's, go, let's take this to a different place. Uh, can I get a witness that life's still going to be life? It's still going to have its ups and its downs. It's whips and it's whirls. There's even sickness and laughter in life. Man, but isn't it great that when you're in life and you finally decide to make Jesus Lord of your life, that you're not alone anymore? You now have somebody in the passenger seat with you. You've got the Holy Spirit, your comforter, to bring you peace throughout this life. But not only that, God didn't just give you the Spirit. He gave you each other. So you don't have to live life alone. Isn't that good? When you decided to make Jesus Lord of your life, whether you think you can finish this life or not, you're kind of committed and you're not alone. Isn't it great to have others? I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. This is important. This is where we're going to end today. We got, we got to hurry because I got a lot to talk about. If you're taking notes, write down this word. Covenant. 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 Listen, what is a covenant? A covenant is a promise. It's a pact. It's a contract. Okay? And it's different than worldly promises because godly covenants are eternal. And I want to share something very uh, important with you today. I spent... 12 anointed weeks speaking upon the covenants of God a couple years ago. I know many of you were here and some of you weren't, weren't able to, to hear that. So this might be review for some. But, but it was food to our soul. But how many know sometimes we need reminding about the promises of God in our life? That the promises of God in Jesus are all yes and amen. And so this is what I want to share with you this morning. Is that as Christians... We don't need just worldly friendships. We need covenantial friendships. Covenantial friendships. God, our God that we serve, is a covenantial God. He has covenant with us through the blood of Jesus. And, and, and because of God and His nature, we should have covenant with one another. With one another. James, the brother of Jesus, 
said in James chapter 2, verse 23. He said, and so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God. That means Abraham had faith. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. Church, this morning we sang a song, and that song said that you are a friend of God. And a lot of times, this was me even. When I would sing a song that I'm a friend of God, I would kind of have the thought in the back of my mind like, yeah, but. I'm a friend of God if I'm living up to his righteous requirements. If I didn't mess up like I did last week. Church, that's religion. That's not relationship with the Lord. And God said that you are his friend. And I'm going to show you how through his promise, through his covenant. James said that Abraham, through his promise, he was considered a friend of God. A couple chapters later, James also said to New Testament believers, because the book of James is found in the New Testament, he was the brother of Jesus. He said to New Testament believers this, he said, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In other words, why do you keep calling yourself a friend of God when you're arm in arm with the world? Now, why was James having to tell this to New Testament believers? Why would he have to bring this up about their friendship with God anyway? Because he knew that New Testament believers in Jesus, Romans says, partake of the same promises of Abraham. That you and I, not only because of the, not, not because of the blood in our veins, but because of the faith in our heart, make us a, a, a part of the promise of Abraham. We are now considered, as Romans says, the seed of Abraham. He was a friend of God. Church, I want to give you good news this morning. You and I are a friend of God. You having a rough day? Just remember, you're a friend of God. You're worried about a sickness? Just remember, you're a friend of God. You're recovering from a surgery? Just remember, you're a friend of God. Amen. Amen. But God made a promise to Abraham, and he kept his promise to Abraham, and out of that promise, we are also partakers of that covenant after the seed of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, says it this way. It says, Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. God's commitment, church, was to Jesus, him on the cross. So God and Jesus, they came together and they made a pact. They made a covenant. They made a promise. And when they made it, what's the weak link in their covenant? There is no weak link in their covenant. See, covenant's only as good as the weakest link, right? If you enter into covenant with a friend, but your, your, your friend is a liar, that covenant's only as good as that lying friend is. Does that make sense? But if you've entered into covenant with Jesus, how good is that covenant? It's unbreakable. It's unbreakable. God and Jesus made a covenant on your behalf on the cross of Calvary. And God's committed to you and he's committed to friendship with you. If that's our father, and that's how he's committed to us, would it stand to reason that we should be that committed with one another? With each other? And godly covenantal friendship? I'm not saying you've got to draft up a contract, right? Don't hear what I'm not saying. You gotta, well, we're, Trent said that we've got to be friends now, so <laughs> I shall be thy friend if thy love the cowboys and detest thy eagle. Amen. I thought you were going to shout me down, David. Amen. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we've got to engage with one another. We've got to be present, and we've got to be engaging, and we've got to love with true love, a sincerity love, a deep kind of love. And then we show our love by our actions. In community, we engage with one another in Christ, and we're committed. Let's not be like the world, amen, and their fair-weathered friendships. Let's make sure our friendships are deeper. In Jesus, I'm going to give you an example of a great biblical friendship. David and Jonathan. Not this David and Jonathan, although they're great, great friends. But David and Jonathan. 
uh, King David and his friend Jonathan. And I don't know if you all know this story or not. I I pray that the, the Spirit of God can reveal this to you. But David and Jonathan, they were great friends. It, this is all found, if you want to take notes, it's all found in 1 Samuel chapters 18 through 20 and 2 Samuel chapter 9. And that's the story that we're talking about today. But I want you to get this. Jonathan, he is in the house of Saul, who's the present king of Israel, but he's not of the house of Saul. It's kind of like Christians, we're in the world, but we're not, we're not to be of the world. Okay? So he's in the house of Saul, he's not of the house of Saul, because... He's a friend of David. He's a friend of David. And at this time, for whatever reason, Saul detests David. He can't stand David. He hates David. He's so jealous. He's so envious of David and the call of God on David's life. And so what happens is anger takes over. And and bitterness takes over. And he begins to spoil and poison his household with his words where the household became distant to David. He hated him so much, he even tried to kill David. The Bible says that he tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. Not just once, but two times he tried to pin David to the wall. I don't know about you, but if if someone tried to pin me to the wall with a spear, once enough, I ain't coming to your house anymore. Stop playing with your swords around me. Anyway. So he tried to kill David twice by pinning him to the wall with the spear. Saul thought that he was so clever that he he let David marry one of his daughters. Not because of love and love's sake. But he he thought that if if David married his daughter, he he could entrap David that way. He could use his daughter to kill David. There was a time that Saul was trying to kill David and his daughter knew about it. And, and Michael, David's wife, Saul's daughter, said, these are the plans of my father. Run! That's what my daughter's going to say to her first boyfriend. <laughs> Run! <laughs> but, I'm kidding. Y'all stop looking at me like that. But we'll see what happens. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. So she had, to, she had to help him escape out of a window so he could escape Saul trying to, to kill him and take his life. But Jonathan, though, Saul's son, loves David. And you see in the scripture that, that Jonathan and David, they enter into, and the Bible calls it, a covenant with one another. Not only, did, not only were they friends, but they were so serious about their friendship that they made a promise to each other. Not once in the Bible, but twice. They made two covenants with each other between David and Jonathan. And their love was so great that in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says that when Jonathan was killed in battle, yeah, Saul was killed and, and Jonathan and all of the brothers, but when Jonathan was killed, the Bible says that David wept greatly and he cried for his friend Jonathan. Jonathan was a friend Uh, Yeah, Jonathan was a friend to David. So in 2 Samuel chapter 4, after the battle and the death of Saul and Jonathan and Jonathan's brothers, word gets back to the palace that Jonathan has died. He's been been killed. And Jonathan had this son, and his son was named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. And Jonathan had uh, this nurse taking care of Mephibosheth, and when she heard the news... That, that Saul had died, the king, and Jonathan, the prince, and all the other princes had died. She was in fear for her own life. She thought David was going to come and was going to kill her and everyone too. So she picked up Mephibosheth. He was about five years old. And she starts to run with Mephibosheth, and she trips. And she falls, and the Bible says that she breaks him so much that he became crippled for the rest of his life, Mephibosheth was. And so she, she takes Mephibosheth, uh, this, this poor kid to this, 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 this desert of a town called Lubbock. I'm sorry, called, called, called Lodibar. It's just as silly, I know. Lodibar. And so she takes him down to Lodibar, and, and he's an adult now, and his whole life he's been told, 
as, as back as far as he can remember, because how many can remember before five? Very few of us. As far as you can remember, that David hates you. King David's not the rightful heir to the throne. You were the rightful heir to the throne. David robbed you of the throne. Your father was a prince and you would have been king one day. David's the reason that you're crippled. It's David's fault that you're in poverty in Lodibar. It's David's fault that you're in the condition that you're in. So he's told all these lies. He's fed all these lies. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David remembers his covenant with Jonathan. And he begins to cry. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Verse 1. One day David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness? Notice this. For Jonathan's sake. Not for David's. Is there anyone in Saul's house that I can show kindness so I can be known and seen among men? It wasn't for David's sake. It wasn't even for, for whoever was left alive in Saul's house. It wasn't for their sake. Whose sake was it for? Because of the covenant. For Jonathan's sake. He summoned a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. I want you to notice this. When we are in covenantal relationship with one another, covenantal friendship with one another, a godly friendship, the kindness that we show each other is not our own. We show them God's kindness. You know what God's kindness looks like? It looks like more than your kindness. When you're a friend in covenantal relationship with another friend in Christ, and they're in need, your kindness goes so far. And then you think in your heart, eh, I did enough. God's kindness is more than enough. And that's when you go even further in the Lord. The Spirit will lead you by utterance. The Spirit will lead you by unction. The Spirit will direct your path. And when you feel Him go, no, do more, you give Him God's kindness. Amen? Amen. So that's what He wanted. He wants to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both of his feet. Where is he, David asked, the king asked. In Lodibar, Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Emil. So David sent him and brought him from Machir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When, when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. Why would David have to tell Mephibosheth, don't be afraid? Fear not. Why? Because his whole life he's been told all these lies about David, about the king. And, 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 and now he's thinking, well, it's over. David's found me. David's captured me. He's going to kill me now. And David sees the fear on Mephibosheth's face and says, don't be afraid. Listen, don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise, covenant, because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Amen. Saul was the king. He had a lot of property. It was rightfully David's. David was the new king. But out of God's kindness, because of his promise to Jonathan, he gave Mephibosheth everything. He gave him everything. And Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? You know what that sounds like? It sounds like me 20 years ago. When, when people said, Jesus loves you. And I said, who am I? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Which is true. But I thought that I was still in that condition. And I'm just worthless. I'm no good. And, and people would tell me that too. They'd say, you're just barely saved by the skin of your teeth. I don't even have skin on my teeth. Amen. 
Did anyone ever grow up being here, hearing that you're saved by the skin of your teeth? That's dumb. But I felt like Mephibosheth. That's guilt. That's shame. He thought, it's over. You're coming to kill me. I've been told my whole life that you hate me, David. I've been told my whole life that you're guilty for the condition I'm in. And now you're saying that you're going to give me everything? All of this? And I can sit at your table? The king's table? Not based on anything I've done or what I haven't done or based on my conduct. You said you're going to restore all that's mine. And David, notice his response in verse 9. His response in verse 9 says this. Says this. The king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your masters at Saul's, I've given Saul's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. He didn't look at Mephibosheth and go, yeah, you're, you're a dead dog. So if you, if you live up to these requirements, I'm going to start giving you pieces of land. He didn't say that. He didn't say, this is Mephibosheth to Ziba. I'm going to give him Saul's land. He said, I have given him all that was his grandfather's. Church, this is good. I, I want to show you this. Why would David go to such great lengths for someone he didn't even know? For someone he didn't even know? Because he was in a bond, in a tight covenant with the relationship that he had with Jonathan. Isn't that different with what you see in the world? It's different. He was engaged. Church, I'm telling you, there's someone else that has entered into covenant with you and I. Someone else that's entered into covenant with you and I, who, is, who has become a man, his name is Jesus. He engages with you, but listen, he engaged with you on the cross of Calvary. And he was engaged with you on that cross. I want to show you this, church. God is our David. Jonathan is our Jesus. You and I are Mephibosheth. We are crippled by the fall of Adam. And the world's telling you all these lies about God. He doesn't really love you. He doesn't care for you. He hates you. You're in the condition you're in because God's not a loving God. He's a vengeful, wrathful God. But that's not God at all, is it? No. You and I are Mephibosheth. We don't deserve a thing. We were at, at war with God. We were an enemy to God. Because of Adam and the sin, we were crippled. But God cut a covenant with His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He shed His blood on the cross. He rose Him from the dead. He seated Him on the throne. He made Him king of the cosmos. And then anybody that would accept it, anybody who accept the covenant that God made with Jesus would have a seat at the king's table. Have a right to the Father's house. Be given keys to the kingdom, church. Be given keys to the kingdom. And now, church, can be called a friend of God after the seed of Abraham. Can I get a witness that God is present? Amen. That God, amen. That God engaged with us on the cross. And God is still engaging with us today. He's still engaging with us today. He has covenant with you. Not for what you've done. Not for who you are. Not for how holy you think you have to be. Or the condition you find yourself in even this morning. But God is in covenant with you, not for your sake, but for Jesus' sake. God is in covenant with you. Why should we be present with each other? Because God's present with us. Why should we engage with one another? Because God is engaging with us. Why should we enter into covenant? Because our Father enters into covenant with us. Church, it means more when we enter into covenantial friendship with one another in the body of Christ. More than just the world. I don't know if I can do that, Pastor. You're kind of committed now, amen? Let's just enjoy the ride. You and I are a friend of God, amen? Let's give Him praise for that. Amen.